Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for coming along. And uh, I think, first of all, I should say my thanks to the National Youth Agency who have helped us along on this journey, particularly Adam, Jonathan, and Lee, um, as well as, of course, uh, all the um, MPs that came along to the different uh, sessions um, uh, and our usual uh, supporters in the uh, APPG, YMCA and BYC. But uh, let me start off. When, um, when I got into power, or got into uh, elected, <laughs> I wish, I'm dreaming, dreaming there. When, when, when I got elected, at the same time as Ben, um, one of the things that I was particularly concerned about was that there hadn't been a focus on youth work for a number of years. Um, and part of that was because it didn't neatly fall in within a, um, uh, within a select committee. And uh, YMCA and BYC came and asked if I would be the chair of uh, the APPG. And I said, really keen to, but what I really want to do is do something that focuses on what's happened to youth work. And I went to NYA and they were extremely positive about the idea of us spending a few months looking and exploring um, what uh, has happened to youth work. See the positives that have happened and see the recommendations that uh, um, have come out of that. And through that journey, um, actually we've had real good cross-party support. A lot of the time, actually, I've been um, the sole Labour person, and we've had um, uh, Conservatives dominating, as you can see we, on this panel here. Maybe that is a story, maybe that is a story of life, but I think that is a, a, positive, a, pos a positive outcome, that this is a real cross-party piece of work, and it will continue. What we see here, and I'll go through the recommendations uh, in a second, is an interim outcome of that evidence that was received in paper and a number of the hearings that took place. Um, the idea is that this is now out for the sector, the community, young people to kind of discuss and take a part. And I know one of the things that we will do in the APPG is we will hold a special session with young people um, for them to come and talk um, and say, actually, we think you need, haven't put this in or you have put that in. Um, and we will also continue to do a number of visits. I know Ben and I her, um, did one in his constituency. You've got one booked in um, in Lincoln um, in a few weeks' time, and we'll be doing one this afternoon, in fact. So to continue to do um, those visits where we see what's happening on the ground. And then in December, a fuller um, report uh, with all the evidence which... Um, accounts for more than that, you know, kind of it's a big pile of evidence that we hope to deposit in the House of Commons Library um, electronically um, and possibly also uh, physically um, so that it can be accessed uh, by people as a resource going forward. So what, was, what are the preliminary outcomes of uh, the discussion? Uh, these are in no particular order um, of priority, so don't take any... Um, uh, any inference from the numbering. Uh, the first one is what we heard from a lot of people is that they felt youth work was part of the education offer. It was part of that wider education offer. In most councils it is um, uh, seen under the children's or education departments of councils and it had traditionally been seen like that um, in, uh, in national government when Tim was uh, uh, the minister um, and uh, not to blow too much smoke um, up to you, Tim, but I think oh, you're very free. good. You, actually, one, one, of the, one of the best ministers we've had in the last eight years on, on, on youth uh, issues. Um, so uh, one of the things that we uh, said was um, that youth is a distinct um, educational process. It supports the personal and social development of young people, and therefore it needs to be recognised as such, and a placing within the Department for Education could provide a better sounding for that holistic approach of education, particularly, for example, in, um, uh, in Nottinghamshire, we saw how they had co-located 
um, some of the youth centres in schools, they had redeployed PRU budgets into um, youth service <coughs> budgets, you know, uh, pupil referral units into youth service budgets so that actually youth service was part of that holistic offer in terms of education and peop keeping people in education. Um, and, and that might well be a better placing for it. The second uh, recommendation uh, that we came to was that in the comprehensive spending review, which will happen next year, youth service needs to be considered. At the moment, youth kind of gets lost in a myriad of lines of the budget and of spending reviews. And one of the first things that needs to happen of that is actually an assessment of what we are spending for young people. And um, the restoration of the local authority audit that was previously funded by government and carried out by the MYA, that could be a possibility of how it should go back to. But it could be done differently. I'm not being, we're not being prescriptive. But what we are saying is that audit needs to be the baseline. How can you ensure that you are providing sufficient youth activities, as we've just heard, is the statutory duty, unless you are making sure you're doing that audit, um, at least um, on a regular basis. So that is our second recommendation. That audit needs to be restored, and that allows the comprehensive spending group then to assess where the needs are and where they are not. Uh, number three um, was to... Um, to secure greater investment and political buy-in, there needs to actually be a greater understanding of the role of youth work and the impact of youth services. And one of the things we notice is very often there was this kind of polemic between um, statutory youth services and voluntary <coughs> youth services. And actually it's totally unnecessary. And there needs to be a better understanding um, of the statutory <coughs> and voluntary service forming a compact <coughs> together and with young people about how they recognise the benefits of youth work and the benefits of all different kinds of youth work. And we, that's kind of a recommendation not necessarily to government but to the, the sector to, 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 to take. And we notice actually there's been some positive developments on that in the last few years but further is still needed. Number four um, is that we actually welcome the government's commitment, as we've heard a bit today, to review and look at that statutory duty. Um, what does it mean? We call on the youth sector and other bodies to fully engage in that consultation of what a statutory duty means. And we recommend at the end of that process, it's not just a review, there needs to be clearer guidelines on what sufficient provision under the legal duty is. Because at the moment, we know that you can drive a horse and cart through that provision and therefore you get some authorities that spend huge amounts of resources and some that spend very little. At number five, um, just as the local authority doesn't necessarily run schools in its area, um, in all areas uh, now, um, it still has to plan for sufficient <laughs> school places. Um, and what we recommended is that there is a role for the local authority to ensure there is sufficient quality youth work provision in the area in the same way as you would plan for school places. Now you plan for school places looking at demographic data, you look at the spend per pupil, you look at then um, particular vulnerabilities of young people and then you develop a plan for education and schooling and that similarly needs to happen with youth work. Um, number six. Over the last decade, we noted that universal youth services have been especially hard hit, with the notable exception of the National Citizenship Service, which provides a great experience for 16 and 17-year-olds, but is time limited and just one part of the broader offer to support year-round provision that meets young people's needs locally. We call for clear guidelines and investment in a baseline of local services. This goes along with the, the idea of a clear duty. What is that uh, baseline for local youth services, which allows an ecosystem of youth work to flourish in the community? Of course, the youth offer has to include NCS, which has become a staple of a lot of communities' youth offer. But that can't end there. And if it does end there, um, we end up with a, um, a very bitty kind of youth offer that just affects a small age range, although it is very good. Um, uh, number seven, uh, we talked about the workforce. A coherent workforce strategy needs to be developed.
for the totality of the children's workforce and a renewed national standard of youth work by 2020. The current standard ends in 2020, so there needs to be the renewal of that standard or the continuation of it at least. We recommend that all those supporting youth work adhere to the national occupation standards and curriculum for youth work training, of which is developing at the moment to include apprenticeship routes and other routes into youth work. At number eight, youth work recognised as education in open access provision and in supporting vulnerable young people in its targeted provision. We recommend the reinstatement of the role of Ofsted, you could choose another inspection body, but Ofsted seems the most uh, uh, reasonable, uh, as a driver for quality in youth work and services. The other big problem, and that goes back to the very initial uh, um, uh, issue, is about audits, seeing what is happening and where, where there is quality and where it is driven. Now, clearly, you don't want an inspection framework that's like schools, but Ofsted already has different inspection frameworks for early years, for childminders, and actually it shouldn't be beyond uh, the wit of Ofsted and man to be able to say there at least needs to be some light-touch framework of understanding quality and inspection. Those are our eight initial um, uh, outcomes, uh, and they are open for you to agree, disagree, uh, challenge and say where we haven't gone far enough or maybe we've gone too far. But the point is to start that conversation um, and to put it out there that youth work is an important <coughs> pillar of our communities and where it has fallen between the gaps so far, we must try and raise it up and raise the profile. Um, and on that note, I want to hand over to my, my colleagues who are going to say about their um, uh, feelings of the, of, of the inquiry and where we are going on, on, on youth services. Um, thanks, Lloyd. I think that, that neatly sums it up. It has been a very um, positive cross-party experience, actually, and I enjoyed uh, particularly your visit to Mansfield. And uh, Nottinghamshire, as Lloyd said, is one of the places that, that kind of still does have an open access youth provision, although it's changed... Um, in a number of ways. I think one of the key things that came out of the inquiry and the discussion for me was that variation on a local level, uh, particularly with project restraints as to how different local authorities had made the changes to youth services. Some have got rid of that open access provision altogether. Others like Nottinghamshire have chosen to keep it but in fewer centres and have uh, this big gap we now have over the summer in particular that leaves young people with, with not that similar, same level of support over the summer break. But it was particularly um, you know, encouraging and in inspiring in many ways to see the impact that the, the particular service that we visited, uh, it was called the Garage, which is linked to Garibaldi School in my constituency. It's literally a shed on the side of the road attached to the school. Um, but the impact that that had on the young people, um, the, the young girl I remember in particular, who had become almost the leader of the kids at the yeah. garage um, and was very forthright about her views as to what it should be and how it should work uh, and had taken on a real role there. And in her life, actually going back later on and talking to her in more detail, uh, it was kind of the, the one uh, consistent thing in her life um, and the one place that she could go to get a bit of um, regular help and support and that consistency that she didn't get at home. I think that highlights to me the importance of that open access provision that actually you may not meet certain criteria to go uh, and tick the boxes to get access to very specific targeted care and help but actually there will be many, many children and young people who will benefit from that universal provision so that I, I found particularly interesting and the comparison even in my own constituency between the garage which as I say is a shed on the side of the road and we also have an incredible My Place centre um, that came, uh, you know, with huge amounts of money spent on it um, that kind of focus youth services into this amazing building with incredible facilities that gets an awful lot of use. But actually, one thing that we did learn from the young people is that if they have to travel a long way to get to it, they're not going to go. So we've taken away these sheds on the side of the road and have this fancy centre, but actually that means probably that the, the, uh, the amount of young people using it, uh, and certainly in those um, often more deprived communities further away from the town, um, is, is less so the, uh, a real challenge in terms of and highlighting actually the lack of um, kind of coherent strategy that I think we're calling for um, in these recommendations particularly as I say the, the variation in the way that different councils have managed this and have been able to manage this because we don't have on a national level a clear idea of what sufficient service looks like whether that should be open access or targeted or what 
uh, combination of the two as to what level of voluntary or qualified youth work that should look like. So I hope that these recommendations help um, to kind of highlight that particular issue, which was the one thing that really sprung to my mind through the discussion. I think it personally makes absolute sense for it to be part of the education system. I think it's something that should be, um, as it still is in Nottinghamshire, open to all. Uh, and that connection with school, I think, is quite a powerful thing. Um, just digging through some of the other recommendations, I think it's quite clear that we don't consider youth work, even the role of the Minister for Youth Work, who is also the Minister for Civil Society and Sport and about a million other things. Um, we don't consider youth work as a, a thing in itself within government. It is in a million different lines of the budget in various different places. And to have that coherent offer that we in this room can all understand as to precisely what our youth work provision actually looks like and what we're actually spending on it, uh, bringing back that audit and making that uh, a much clearer thing in, in mind within government, I think, is an incredibly uh, important thing. And also, uh, finally, just to touch on another that, that I find particularly interesting, is about um, giving the council's responsibility, uh, even if they don't deliver that provision. I think, again, harking back to my own constituency experience, we have a variety of council-run youth clubs and military-led youth clubs that have qualified youth workers but are not overseen by the authority. There's very little oversight. But that happens that the, the shed in Warsaw is an example that I, I talk about. It happens to be a fantastic facility that pretty much every young person in Warsaw now goes through. It was set up by a community group um, to, to fill a gap in service. It's been a fantastic thing. But it doesn't have the oversight, the council don't have the responsibility for it, and they can effectively, A, do what they like, which is not always helpful, um, and B, they don't get access to some of the support that council run services do in terms of admin or, or whatever they may need uh, to tick the right boxes. Um, so that oversight, I think, and responsibility from a local government level is, uh, could be an incredibly important thing. I know, um, you know Tracy uh, Crouch, the Minister, has, has had a number of conversations with yourself, Lloyd, and, and with, with me as well. I'm sure um, many colleagues have been in approach to her about this. Um, I think the complexity of this as an issue and trying to drag it all down into one coherent message and one plan um, it's kind of overwhelming within uh, government and within her department and along so many other things that she has to take on. Um, so I think being able to narrow this all down um, in what is, I think, a very clear uh, set of suggestions and, and asks, if you like, through the comprehensive spending review uh, and as we look forward to the second half of this parliament actually should be, I hope, very helpful for her and for that uh, department in terms of how they can look at delivering this kind of strategy going forward. <coughs> Right, well that doesn't leave a lot for me to say, but I just want to have to put, put some, some things in context and just draw out some positives and some um, negatives. But first of all, an over, overbearing feeling of deja vu. And, and I'm slightly fraudulent here, because I've really been tangentially involved with the report, and I think it's a really good piece of work, so I'll blow some smoke back at, uh, uh, at Lloyd as well for the, the lead he's taken on, uh, uh, on this. And you always know when it's time when you're identified as an old fart and you hand over to the new young thrusters, because when Lloyd first got elected and I went to introduce myself, because I didn't think we'd met before, and he pointed out that I had spoken at his school when he was at school. And, I was at <laughs> and, he, and he and I went to the same school as, uh, as well in, um, in Sussex. So it's time to refresh this, um, this bit of work. And it's great there are new, enthusiastic, energetic people in Parliament uh, to do that, and it's really encouraging to see such a good turnout here again today, despite all the trials and tribulations of what's happened in the youth sector over the last few years, there are still a lot of champions who absolutely believe in it, from people like Paul Aginsky, who I work with so closely on NCS and things like that. Um, but there is a sense of deja vu, because you know we sort of did this work when I was the youth minister, and where we did have a youth minister, when everything to do with children and youth was concentrated in one department. And I think it's a step backwards that responsibility for youth and for children has been fragmented across government in a number of, uh, of, of different departments. That's a, the first uh, point. But what we identified back in the Positive for Youth report that we did in 2011, which was a really brilliant bit of work involving many people in this room and beyond, but crucially involving hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of young people, culminating in 350 of them all getting together at the O2 Centre to pull apart the final draft version of our report, so it absolutely was by them and they felt engaged with it and part of it, which was really um, uh, important. But at the time when clearly there were going to be financial impacts on the sector, because of the way it's structured through local authorities, because it's a soft touch, 
when local authorities are under funding um, pressure. And also, I think, because youth work has never really been reformed. I mean, we produced our report 50 years on from the Albemarle report, and youth services haven't actually changed an awful lot. So what I was keen to do, well, we've made some progress, but we've still a long way to go, is that youth services cannot be seen in isolation, responsibility of a local authority almost on a sort of nine-to-five basis. It needs to be where kids want it and will take advantage of it, and that means uh, working with businesses, working with youth organisations, charities, uh, independent sector, uh, whatever, in partnerships. And there were too many youth groups treading on each other's uh, toes and a lot of personality clashes in the sector. So if there's one upside of financial pressures, actually it's brought the sector together to try and create some common voice and harmony. We still haven't got there, but there's a long way to go. Second point is, on the positives, I think the voice of young people uh, and the influence of young people in this place has improved hugely. The UK Youth Parliament, again, the sitting um, next, next week, is a big success and MPs know about it. UKYP's members in local constituencies are active, certainly they are in my constituency. He's always telling me what I'm doing wrong and what the government should be uh, doing, which is fantastic. The fact we have youth mayors uh, across the whole of the UK, we have youth councils and others who are sitting at the top table alongside councillors and and others and having varying degrees of influence. That wasn't there 10 years um, uh, ago. And the Youth Select Committee we have here doing serious work, producing serious reports from young people about things that interest young people, and that's things that interest adults as well, but it needs to be put in a young person's uh, context. And the fact the government now responds to those reports, we now routinely have debates on those reports, we have come a long uh, way. And uh, Ben referred to My Place as well. That was a huge success story, the My Place programme, started by the last government continued by uh, this government as, uh, as well, but it's not just a case of building these fantastic centres, 63, that we had at the outset around the country. It's what goes on in them as well and who you attract and the, how busy they are that, that really matters. So the third point is, and where we have got the weakness, is at the local uh, level and where we have lost a huge amount of youth activity, localised youth activity, and uh, qualified youth uh, workers. And I absolutely latch on to the bit in this report, and Lloyd emphasised it, about the educational uh, advantages of youth work. The NYA, and again, thank you to them for the support they've given to the group in this report, commissioned a, uh, a, a review, which I chaired a few years ago, about youth workers and schools, and how the two things are absolutely complementary, and how where schools um, sort of put the shutters down to um, youth workers, then you see the impact on the, the social... Uh, impact and the behaviour of some of the kids as, uh, as well. The smart schools have youth workers in schools, <coughs> helping alongside you know, the, what I call the healthy living agenda. And when we need to do so much more on sex and relationship, um, education, uh, everything going on with crime and drugs and, uh, and county lines and everything, we need youth workers who, ha- who can empathise with young people, who they will trust and confide in and listen to rather than Mrs. Miggins, the geography teacher, trying to tell them all about responsible sex, which just doesn't cut the mustard, I'm afraid, in too many uh, many areas. And youth workers are the people to do that. And if you look at the Troubled Families Programme, which has been largely successful, there's a lot of former youth workers who are proving really good at that programme because they know how to engage uh, with, uh, with many of those kids with all sorts of problems. But youth work mustn't just be about engaging with the problem kids. It must be about engaging with all kids so it's not seen as stigmatising that you only have a youth worker because you're a troublemaker or or whatever it is. So that's where Universal Youth Services actually has a role. So I absolutely support, as I tried to do in my time before I got defenestrated at the Department for Education, to bring back a proper, meaningful statutory duty. I hope we're going to get something along those uh, lines. We need to recognise youth work within the Comprehensive Spending Review um, next year as, uh, as, as well. And I just think I have two pleas. We need a strong voice for young people in a dedicated department in government. And Tracy Crouch is a fantastic ambassador for young people, but she's got to deal with sport and charities, civil society and everything else uh, as well. And so only a bit of her time can be on this important subject she has a lot of enthusiasm for. But secondly, the sector needs to speak with a single strong voice. And that has been what has been missing for so so many years. And if this can help bring that voice 
um, back together and bang that drum for young people, on behalf of young people, but with young people, then this report actually would have achieved quite a lot. We haven't got the final report yet. These are just some early uh, recommendations, but it's an important part of that journey. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, we have a rich audience of people with, I'm sure, plenty of questions to ask uh, our wonderful panel, and I've got some glamorous assistants with uh, roving mics, so uh, if you'll allow us a, uh, a few extra minutes, I would like to really open it up. Um, um, a fantastic uh, response, thank you very much, from the three of you, and uh, hopefully some equally fantastic questions from the audience. Uh, who'd like to make a start? We've got the first one over there. Get your, uh, get your steps up today, John. Thank you. I'm uh, Adam Muirhead from the Institute for Youth Work, and um, thank you for that. That was really affirming. I wanted to ask a question about whether or not the, um, the inquiry had uh, reached a consensus on the viability or the support for the JNC Pink Book, the terms and conditions that represent the kind of high-quality standards of youth work that, um, that we aspire to achieve. Uh, who, would, who would like to take that one first? Lloyd, Lloyd would. Um, <laughs> Ouch. I, I attended the uh, negotiation committee, uh, um, the JNC committee, uh, about two months ago to present where we were going with, with this. Um, I think the, the point of um, uh, number seven, where we say we recommend all those supporting youth work adhere to national occupational standards and curriculum for youth workers. I think that that is a broader point of not just the curriculum, but the national standards and occupational standards. Now, we haven't mentioned the Pink Book per se. The Pink Book is a particular standard that was designed for local authorities particularly in mind, although the voluntary sector does sit on the JNC. Um, uh, I don't particularly care what it's called, Pink Book, Blue Book, National Book, standards for youth workers, pay stand, whatever. But I think we do agree that there needs to be some kind of national standard that's not just about pay, uh, but that is about kind of the standards that you expect youth workers to fulfil, the level of training that we kind of offer um, youth workers and that they should be uh, fulfilled, and the different routes into youth work um, and out of it. So yes, broadly, is the answer. Thank you. Um, would anybody like to comment before I put it back? Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. I think we had one uh, on the front here. And then we'll take the, front, the one at the front next. Um, hello, my name's David Williams. I'm Senior Youth Work Coordinator at Felton Prison. Um, I, um, the question really is um, in regards to point three that was made by the APPG, saying that to secure investment there needs to be a better understanding of what youth work actually is and the impact of youth work. And I, I totally agree. Um, I think the NYA have done an excellent job in defining what youth work is um, around personal social health education for young people. But people still seem to belittle youth work. Um, as I, I feel as a youth worker, I've always felt like a second class citizen to most of the other people that I work with, all the other partners, they look, they look down on youth work. Now, what I'd like to know is, how are we going to convince these other people that youth work is important and that it has the impact that it has. I mean, I know that our outcomes may be softer, they may be more long term in terms of when you realise that they happened, but how are we going to convince everybody else? I think everyone in this room knows the impact of youth work and what we do and the value, but how are we going to convince everybody else of that? Yeah, I think it's a challenging thing. One of the discussions we've had through the course of this um, report and, and putting it together, particularly with the NIA, has been about how we uh, we put facts and figures and hard data on the impact, because as you said, it is a, a softer, long-term thing, and you, you almost can't prove a negative. You know, in the, if you've prevented something from happening, how do you prove it was you that prevented it? Um, it's a real challenge, but I think there are long-term trends, and particularly when you look at um, you know things like the Troubled Families Programme uh, and the impact that it has on some particular families with some very, very intense challenges in many cases, you can quite clearly track. Um, our local authority, Ashfield Next Door to Me, have tracked through that process uh, precisely the outcomes for those families, precisely what money that saved the taxpayer that can be reinvested in other places, and I think there are, um, there are ways of doing it. It just seems to be a long-term um, 
process, but one of the things that, that certainly came out of the discussion was uh, certainly the NIA's commitment to, to trying to, to pull some of those facts and things together and to make the case and, and set out that evidence. Um, so I think it is a challenging thing, absolutely. And uh, you're right, though, that when we talk about some of the, the things we see societally, we talk about knife crime in London and all these other um, issues, the first thing that so many people say is youth provision, youth services, um, is, is the answer to this. I think that um, that's broadly recognised. Uh, sometimes from a government perspective if we to look, at, look at data so if we can find some data to back up what we all know uh, we'll be in a better place Thank you very much um, Adam, can I bring you on in this? Yeah, um, I think one of the points that came out is it's not necessarily what youth work is it's what is a youth worker sometimes people don't understand that and uh, one thing that will certainly be in the final report um, that came out pretty strongly from all the evidence is there are quite a lot of principles of youth work that everyone here and everyone who submitted evidence knows about it's trying to translate those principles to other people who don't necessarily uh, know what youth work is, don't know what the value of it is, and don't know where it sits. And that's why one of the key points is to find out where it sits and actually try and impress that as well upon people. Um, so it's a two-fold thing. It's not just what youth work is and what the value of it is, but what is a youth worker and where do they sit? And that's, um, that's one thing that I hope comes out in this, but certainly will come out in the final report. Thank you very much. Uh, next question. Hi, good morning. My name is Omar Richards uh, from the University of East London. First, I'd like to, um, to congratulate you on that piece of research. I feel that if we were to get some of those actions um, to fruition, we'll make a real um, change uh, in the sector. But uh, my main question is, uh, while we're looking at the changes and um, how we evaluate uh, and define the role of a youth worker, I just wondered what your thoughts were on a licensing or register for our practitioners and could that in a sense might change um, society's view in how a role is defined being on a register helps to also monitor um, a, a role as youth workers Tim was this something you looked at earlier? Um, this, this issue sort of comes around every so, so often and if you look at I mean, just to go back to the last uh, question the problem youth workers have, have got is you are, your job is to prove a, prove a negative uh, and um, too often we judge the progress or not of young people by uh, did they not end up in Felton, did they not end up as a teenage pregnancy, did they not start smoking at 12 or something like that, rather than uh, what progress they've, they've made. And where we do judge it by progress they've made, it's largely by academic qualifications. And for many people, that's not the best judge of actually how much progress they've, um, that they've made. Um, so I think there is a perception problem about youth workers, that for some people they're seen as a bit of a sort of soft option, completely un unfairly, and in the same way that nursery workers, I think we undervalued and saw as a soft option, um, I think the profession has been raised by more requirements coming on uh, those people going into work with nurses, and why shouldn't they be? You know, you are working with young children at perhaps their most impressionable time. Uh, when they're growing up and their brains are forming and everything, absolutely want somebody who knows uh, what they are, what they're doing. And of course, when you're dealing with some challenging um, kids, slightly older as well, you need to have youth workers there who absolutely know all about youth work and how to engage and empathise with, with young people. So I think there may be a role for some form of uh, registration qualification uh, schemes, <coughs> those obviously you can still do, although there are not so many of them, various university courses and others um, in it. But at the same time, youth work isn't all about a single straight-jacketed professional. There's a load of people who come to youth work on a voluntary or part-time voluntary basis, and what we don't want is to regulate them out of the system uh, as, as well. So I think we have to find a happy, a happy medium. Lloyd, did you want to come in there? Um, I think that... For paid youth workers, it's much easier to start talking about certain levels of, uh, of, of paid full-time kind of youth workers. It's much easier to start talking about that. Um, and uh, I think that there's probably a, a general will that that could be something that would be positive. The devil's always in the detail, isn't it? With the voluntary sector, however, I think that there is a danger, as Tim just mentioned at the end there, that what you start to do is you start to put the thresholds too high. And it may well be that we need to be clearer on what we mean by a youth worker and, say, a youth leader. 
you know, scout leader and a you know, kind of a, a youth club leader that have some sort of oversight by a youth worker. It might well be if you're a scout leader, you have an oversight of um, you know, kind of uh, Gilwell Park, who has a has a kind of you know, the headquarters of the scouts has an oversight to make sure your program standards are good, and that might be different to the kind of oversight we expect for uh, statutory youth workers or youth workers who are working in particularly vulnerable people and situations. So a framework around that. I know when I'm I, I'm a ch uh, on, on the trustee board of a local youth club uh, in Brighton. Um, well, uh, whether we're a youth club or not is, is, a, is a debate to be had now, but um, uh, the, the crew club, and one of the things that we found that sometimes our best people to come in and work with the young people were people who had direct experience in the community, and then how do you train those people up, how do you give them the experiences, put them on the apprenticeship courses, so you don't want to put the barrier uh, at the front door necessarily, you want to put it somewhere later down that corridor when they've already experience some of the positives. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, another question, uh, maybe from this side of the room, the gentleman on the end. Yeah. Hi, morning everyone. Um, I'm Hassan Farouk from Tahams Council. I'm a youth worker. I've been a youth worker nearly 20 years now and I, um, I started off as an engineer in Ford Motor Company and then obviously was made redundant and so I reskilled to become a youth worker. So I'm a classic example in terms of how things can be the difference that can be made. And I'm really music to, to my ears, the kind of aid recommendations that come, come, come down. Um, Lloyd and, and to, to the rest of your team, I mean, congratulations. I mean, this is, this is amazing. I mean, we, we need this kind of stuff. I and mean, we've just gone through a whole major restructure into Hamlets. And obviously, one of the things that we've done, and obviously, um, I might get, um, when I go back, um, yeah. <laughs> But we've de-skilled our um, workforce, and um, we've, we've obviously um, said um, youth work qualifications is necessary, so we've recruited a whole bunch of staff who are not qualified. So I think qualification is really, really essential for us, because we need to have qualified staff. So that recommendation about qualification is really important. Um, but what I want to say, ask was, um, in your um, in research, in that report, do you come across them um, in terms of vulnerability, so things like prevent, um, um, we're looking at and grooming. Um, so you talked about um, uh, shootings because you know young people dying in shootings. The thing for me is there's a whole thing I think we're missing, which is we deal with special education needs and we deal with plans, the statement, statement um, children, and there's specific work being being done. But if the threshold for those young people are not meeting that, and I have a classic example of one young person who, you know, we, um, who would with an apprentice would come in, he would shake specific hands with specific people only, only men and would leave out women and when I, when I challenged that I was accused of being Islamophobic um, but when I, when I told the context to what was going on because I by sheer coincidence stumbled across it because a, uh, a volunteer coordinator was sitting with him on a screen and they were typing in red and when I said why are you typing in red and he said well he's, he's got dyspraxia he, or something which you don't actually see unless sure. it's, it's in red Okay. So for me, I'm sorry, the question, <laughs> but vulnerability, I think, how, we, how do we, does that come across? Because I think all of those children that we're talking about, we're going to maybe um, in, in channel, we're going to grooming, we're going to, into <laughs> drugs. There is an element there, I think, youth work does a tremendous amount of work to be able to actually address those young people. And how do we, how do we, how do we tackle that? Thank you, so, great sorry, question. Sorry to have taken too long. Uh, Ben, did you pick that one up? Yeah, just to say that the lady, young lady we met in my constituency, um, it was only because of, of universal access to youth work that she stayed in school. She was in with the wrong crowd, you know, not doing well at school, dropping out, and we don't have alternative provision in Nottinghamshire. She's ended up out of the system, one of an increasing number of, of kids not in education at an age when they should be. Um, so for her, it was a really impactful thing to have that open access. I think you're right that you know, not every vulnerable child is registered with social services. And actually, for them to be able to go and seek the help um, in, a, in a universal service for me is very important. And actually, as a, uh, a means to identify those children who need the more targeted support as well, because it can't always be done currently, certainly through schools and those kind of systems. We've not yet got to the point where um, teachers necessarily have the, the skills and the, the ability to highlight uh, and to, to deal with those cases in school. So, for me, that universal service is, is a hugely important. Thing. Unfortunately, in my, my area, we've still got that to, to some extent. Um, 
but as I say, because it's also where you can access. So as I say, we've got less physical centres now, fewer physical centres, um, and we've gone down into to the My Place Centre and one or two other aspects, which means some of those kids who could go and access that service aren't necessarily on social services, would like to go, but actually it's three miles away and they, they can't get there. Um, I do think sometimes that currently we're, we're keeping children out of the system who actually would really benefit from that support. So uh, you're absolutely right. The more um, the broader it can be, certainly that first element of accessing the service, um, the easier it will be to identify uh, people like the, the young person you, had, you mentioned yourself. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, another question. Um, the lady over there, and sorry to uh, on the third row. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, good morning. My name is Aziz Minot and I am a researcher for um, Sean Berry, who's a London Assembly member. And for two years now we've been leading on the research in terms of the cuts to youth services across London. Um, I really, really welcome the sort of recommendations that you have. I have issues with some of them, but the question that I have <laughs> is... Um, what are you doing or have you looked at space, available space as being an issue? You did mention that youth services have or youth centres have been closed down, but I've been meeting a lot of um, youth workers who are really open to being innovative in different spaces that they have, but there's a lot of empty buildings that they can't access through their councils. Is that something that has featured in this sort of inquiry and what sort of recommendations will you have around that? First of all, Sean's been doing some really good work, some of the reports that probably you've written, you know, kind of um, uh, in, in coming out of her office uh, have, been, have been top notch, so congratulations to you. Um, and, and actually has helped frame some of the discussions that we've had. Uh, actually, space has not been a huge thing that's particularly come up in the inquiry that we've had. I don't know if there has been some of the written research. What I would say is I had a fascinating discussion, not part of the inquiry, but uh, it was a separate discussion for, um, uh, on something else, where we were talking with housing associations and others about funding of youth work. And one of the responses that they said was that actually it's not buildings that are the problem. They've got a line of builders that want to provide a youth room on the side of a new estate that they're building or have some extra 106 money to... It's not necessarily the physical building that is the problem. It's connecting the building and the youth work programme. And we maybe just need to... It's not, you know, it's not the physical space. They are there. But they're just underused or underutilised. Or, as you say, the access isn't quite right. And it's maybe that we need a better link. And I think that that's... The, providing that duty of audit and assessment to the local authority so they know what is available in their area also allows that matchmaking service hopefully to happen better. One of the things that the voluntary sector has said to me is that some of the access to schools is particularly problematic, however. So, the, the, for wrong or right, the, the previous system where you had local authorities that could just open up a school because they were local authority controlled schools and often offer it for free for voluntary organisations to operate. The move to academies has led of course to a feeling that they want to monetize that <laughs> opening up of a school where you have to pay for the caretakers extra hours and that has led to some not being able to access that and again that recommendation of the youth uh, of, the, of, the, of the local authority being able to be a matchmaker hopefully oils those wheels and, and, and makes those cogs a bit better. But we've not had a specific recommendation on it. I don't know if there's been lots of evidence on that. So just quickly to Adam and then to Tim, I think that's OK. Um, yeah, I think ownership of space was definitely beneficial. That came out in a lot of the responses, but it wasn't the be-all and end-all. Um, you know, there are forms of youth work, such as detached youth work, which don't need the space necessarily. They will go to the young people. Um, and that came out in a lot of responses as well. Um, but in terms of utilising space, I think what we found is that there are less and less dedicated youth centres per se. And they're becoming more like community spaces where um, the space is opened up to other people as well. And it actually enhances the community feel and community impact of youth work. Um, so certainly having the space is beneficial and there are less spaces, but it's not necessarily the all and end all. I don't think it's a, an issue of, of space and actually I, want, I think what enhances um, youth work and youth activities is where it's in, integrated into other 
uh, facilities. So, uh, and housing associations actually, I think, have been quite innovative here. So I have uh, my constituents in Worthing, the, the social landlord Worthing Homes, um, they knocked two of their houses on an estate into one and it's become the community house. And it is like Piccadilly Circus there. It is used every day and at weekends for every sort of activity, from babies to homework clubs, to dads and lads reading, to um, young sports teams coming in at the weekends and things like that. Now that, I think, is the model that we want most of all. And that is what I've always tried to get children's centres to be more like. And if there's one way of making children's centres more viable with the pressures they're on at the moment, is not just to have them between nine and five for young children, but to use them for all generations. And it's a great intergenerational tool as well when you've got young kids coming alongside the Darby and Joan club or whatever, and there's a real mutual benefit for that. So this is about where young people will come to and where youth workers can go out with their outreach services to get young people, not just about, as we found with My Place, which is a great scheme, but as Ben uh, said, you've got to get the kids there. And the, the secret of something like Bolton Lads and, uh, um, and Girls Club, which was one of the early forerunners of, of this, is they had a fleet of minibuses going around scooping kids up to bring them to that centre, otherwise many of them wouldn't be able to, uh, uh, to get there. So you've got to think about the mechanics of how you get Mohammed to meet the mountain rather than just building a rather nice mountain, if that's a sort of metaphor. Okay. I was just going to add very quickly, I think the, the, the physical space is one area actually, particularly in those broader community hubs where there is actually cash and support out there to, to go and get help for, the, for those kind of things. Um, which is why I think it's probably less of a challenge. But actually, if you look at, for example, like Sport, Sport England's priorities at the minute are built around less sports facilities, more around community buildings and, and how that can be a much broader thing to go and um, develop. So if you can find the way of getting all of those services into one place, as Tim's um, laid out, then there, there's, there are pots of money like that. And actually in the budget this week, um, the Chancellor, he didn't announce it on the day, but in the Red Book, if you have a look through, uh, page 40 something is um, about 8 million quid for um, community centres, miners' welfares, um, and those kind of buildings that can accommodate that kind of thing. So um, there's positive opportunities. Thank you. I think we've got uh, room for one more question. Uh, the lady on the front there. Hi, I'm Flavia, and I'm from Getaway Girls in Leeds. I manage Getaway Girls. I've been a youth worker for 35 years. And, um, and um, what I wanted to talk about is I missed the beginning. I was on the 6 o'clock train, but I got stuck on the... <laughs> trying to get into here. Um, so, um, so my question's about language and about how... Um, and about strength-based approaches. And I'm, so you may have spoke about the beginning. And I suppose I think youth... I'm going to say youth work fits really well with the whole asset based approach stuff so we've completely changed how we talk about um, the work that we do and how we sell it and I suppose in terms of the strength based approach and your women centred working so how is it important that we're not um, you know, sort of using deficit model and sort of talking about young, women, young people as problems, we do all the work around sexual exploitation, gang related harm hardship crisis, complex needs we do all of that work but we do it in a in a way that's strength-based, and we have young women who come through the project, do leadership programmes. Most of our staff are people who used to come and have been involved in Getaway Girls and have come through and done youth work training and then gone on to uni. So how is important is language? Okay, thank you. Who would like to that first? Um, I think there is a danger, isn't there, in trying to promote youth services. What we do is we go around and say... Knife crime is up, mental health problems are up, etc., etc. I think there is, I mean, there's an understanding, of course, to get politicians to do something, you have to suggest that there's something not quite right, otherwise, we're happy to let it go on as is. So, there's a challenge there in the political talk. I, I do think that we have to recognise that, that politicians are motivated sometimes by perverse kind of, um, uh, you know, by negative things. Um, I think out in the communities, though, it is very important we start talking uh, positively um, about what, uh, what youth work does, um, what it contributes to young people. And the trip that we did to Liverpool, we saw really some real kind of inspirational young people who had really struggled, that had turned young women, that had turned their lives around. And they'd done it in a kind of, um, in a way that then they were passing that message on to, 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 to others. I think 
one thing that I would note is the, the way that National Citizenship Service um, uh, does very effectively engage politicians and engage the community in the positive work that it does. And it's very good at that. And maybe sometimes other pieces of youth work and other youth people in the youth sector need to also positively engage with decision makers. What we saw in your constituency when we asked how come they've just the politicians have just given a hundred thousand pounds to refit the youth centre, and that was because the young people said, well, we don't go to them begging for money when things go wrong. They're invited, the politicians are invited every year, every half a year to come to the youth centre. We show them the good work they've done on celebration evenings, the community is invited in, and what that has done is that built a better understanding so when the councils are sitting down doing the budget, they already know that it's something that they're convinced by. So, yes, you're right, we need to positively talk. We need to not always talk about uh, the, 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 the things that we're doing to stop bad things happening, but talk about the things that we're doing that are just providing positive in the community. But we need to engage politicians in that as well, okay. otherwise it won't be recognised. Uh, I'm going to be cheeky and just ask for one more question. I'm conscious of the fact that actually we have some young people in the room today, and so actually given the fact that actually this is about that community, could we maybe take a question from a, a young person? Is there somebody at the back there? <clears throat> thank you. Hi. Um, for, 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 thank you for taking my, um, my offer. Um, <laughs> to speak. Um, my name's Morgan, um, I'm 17, di diagnosed with autism. Um, I've, been, I've been in and out of the, the care system uh, my life um, and I, I've got a real, real experience of the, the current sy systems. All, all what I'm hearing is academics, 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 when actually not all young, sorry, not all youth workers have to be qualified. We don't all, all have to be highly trained. We don't need to have the A levels. We don't need to go to university. I'm a student at the moment who, who is never going to be able to go to university because I've only got the entry level qualifications. I, I will not get a youth worker's qualification. What I'm saying is, academics are not all the way. Though, what is the panel going to do as part of the report to look at creating vo vocational ways to be, be, becoming a youth worker? Because at the moment, I, I want to be a youth worker, but I don't think I'm never going to be one because of the current legislation we've got at the moment, but, but also I do voluntary work because I love what, what I do, but I just, I don't think, we, we, I, with my disability, I don't think academically I won't ever get there. Thank you. Ben, would you like to go first? Thanks, Morgan, for that. I, I, you know, the passion you've just shown for it there, I hope you carry on trying to do it, and there, there no doubt will be opportunities for you uh, to get involved in, in the future. I think you're absolutely right um, that there does need to be a balance between, as Lloyd's kind of touched on before, and the report does to an extent, a balance between qualified youth work and maybe that registered standard that we've discussed, and also everybody else who is involved in that sector, because chances are actually that... Uh, you know, the qualified youth worker that maybe runs a centre might be looking after six, seven other people who are volunteers or um, have different qualifications and routes into it. Um, to my own experience in Mansfield, Vicky, who uh, runs the garage, if you like, is not the qualified youth worker. She's the one that all the kids look up to yeah. and go to for a bit of discipline and a clip round here when they need it. But actually, she's a volunteer and she's not the one um, who is, is, you know, the qualified one with the certificates. Um, and so somebody, you know, I sit on the Education Select Committee and I absolutely hear what you're saying about um, the discussion always being around academics. It's a big bugbear of mine, particularly with a constituency like mine uh, where not many kids go to university uh, and all of those uh, social challenges. Actually, I'm very much a big believer that we need to have more vocational work-based learning, that we need to um, shift this focus away from academic skills, particularly post-16, into that kind of... Um, work-based education. I think we're starting to do that on a government level. We're looking now 
in more detail at T levels and, and more of that kind of um, skills as opposed to, to academic qualifications, which um, I always felt got a little bit left behind through the kind of go of educational reforms um, going back a few years. But I think we're, we're recognising that and we're starting to shift in that direction with things like um, even degree apprenticeships where you can go and, and get those qualifications on the job um, earn money while you're doing it. You don't have to go uh, and have this, you know, intense academic environment at university. Uh, so hopefully that shift is happening, and that presents um, opportunities in the future for things like, you know, apprenticeships in youth work um, that would be a really positive thing for the industry. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Thank you so, very much. <clears throat> Anybody else before I close? Thank you. Thank you. And, and I just want to thank our panel today for um, for your time, efforts, and energies. Thank and you to NYA as well. Yeah. Thank you very much.